questions. So a lot of this we put up on our website um, through the National Firescape Association. So we have not only this training class, but many others. All right, Nancy, you want to, uh, while we're waiting for a few more people to arrive, uh, we can just answer some general questions. And uh, we can, is there we go? So, um, yeah, man. What are you going to already put the recording? You can already put the recording button on. Oh, okay, great. So, in the meantime, while we're waiting for a few other people, it's not the easiest place to find. Park, hang out, do activities on. I can just answer some general questions for you. Um, again, within the group that you may have specific, and then when I get into the meeting, I can talk about a lot of this stuff. It's a slideshow, and it'll, it'll answer a lot of your questions. But today's uh, focus um, is going to be to really help you guys understand firescapes uh, and just what is, uh, how firescapes are looked at nationwide, but how are you doing firescapes here? And what you may or may not be crossing the line, because you know, uh, uh, I had a meeting with Daryl, and in regards to just just how fine that line is um, uh, when, when you're filling out the form, you know what I'm saying, to make sure you're not crossing that line. So I can answer as many questions as I can. And again, I will screw it up uh, a little bit, but again, anything you should verify with Daryl, you know, as you go along, because uh, how many attended that class for the, uh, uh, for the February one, the Bricer class? Anybody, anybody here? Did you guys go to the Bricer class? Yeah. Very exciting in that you know as they as they're going to get this thing more automated you know there's a lot of buildings that are going to be coming online that are going to be more automated so that things are getting done so I'm very excited about that but let's open it up anybody have questions uh, <coughs> that I can answer that are just specific before we get into a, a general uh, conversation about uh, about this what do you mean about crossing the line what line are you talking about well uh, as Daryl explained to me. There's, you know, you're a tester, not an inspector. So you have to be very careful that you don't influence, uh, influence the, uh, the client in any way, saying that you're giving him a, a more information than he needs. So the code of conduct for your Reg 4 is that in fire escapes, um, and I have a copy of the exam uh, of, the, of the test here. So I think I will cover this again, so we may be answered, but basically what I'll cover today is that in the in the document here on uh, on the Firescape test? You know, you got two parts. The top part I wants you to look at the whole Firescape all the way up to the gooseneck, and then the bottom part is the testing. You're gonna cross the line. Some things, uh, the code nationwide states that Firescapes must be examined by design professionals or others acceptable to the building official or the or the, the authority having jurisdiction. So in some cases. When you get to a train wreck, it actually now requires um, that and somebody else comes in to do an evaluation uh, for the owner. Yeah. It's not um, it's not that you can give the evaluation; they have to bring in whoever they deem professional. So if you have a train, a fire escape that got ripped off the side of a building and it's on the ground, it's going to start involving some design professionals to be involved in there because your job is to test in a system, not to give an evaluation on a system. So. Uh, that's some of the things that we'll cover uh, here today. Any other questions? Okay, this line you're talking about crossing basically is uh, with Reg 4, you tested as it was built and existed at the time of construction. Right. So on certain things on your uh, paperwork that I got or whatever you were uh, talking about, the weight and everything else, determining about the weight the fire escape will handle and everything right. else. The load test, they call it the right. load test. It's not, it's not a Reg 4 requirement. But I'm going to talk about it. So, you know, what we want to do is want to sort of focus today's class on, on everything related to the ladder system. And then, so that will be 75% of our conversation. You know, you can ask me any question about a fire escape. How's it, how do you fix them? You know, as far as the ladders, you know, what are, you, what are your problems? Because we inspect from Maine to Florida, Seattle to San Diego, and from Chicago to Texas. So we have all of those, uh, that information to share with you. But you're limited in what you can examine during a Reg 4. Your reg force, you're a tester, um, you know, and it's down at the bottom that you're testing that system, you know, whether it be the, the, the accordion ladder, whether it be a drop ladder. So, for example, how many people here have had issues with hydraulic ladders? 
leaking like, you know, you got more oil than hydraulic ladders. That's the newfound riches in, in America. You should just start sneaking around and stealing oil from all these ladders and, you know, you'll, you'll be a millionaire because there's so much oil. And uh, how many people have ever seen the little coffee can underneath the, to, keep the, yeah. to catch the drips? Yeah, catch it from the packing. Yeah. yeah. And so, as you know, those are pistons. You know, those are basically a piston with a push in it acts. I have never in my life been able to fix one. Anybody here ever fix one or saw one fixed? Fixed multiple ones. And what haven't you been able to fix about them? Well, a lot of times it's people don't, have, you know, the, the, there's loss of pressure. You know, that you can't maintain the, the, the hydraulics has a bushing inside, correct? Right? The rod comes well, down. Well, it has a washer inside that's inside the diameter of the tube, so. Have you been able to find the bushings? Uh, I've actually made them, literally out of regular washers and stuff like that. So is it is a sixteenth of an inch thick? So you just get them for the inside diameter of the pipe most of the time. So is it a done. bushing or is it a washer that's it's actually a flat washer that's that rides on the bottom of the guide rod? So it only allows X amount of fluid to pass by that washer. So there is a transference of oil from the bottom tube Correct. to the. So when you're cranking it up now, what's the resistance? So this is great information for you guys to know. Like, so are you a, uh, an ornamental guy? Uh, what's no, it's a fire protection company. But okay. It's, learned through the years on servicing them and everything else. You know, when you have leakers and stuff, you have to basically drain the ladder. You've got to exchange the fluid. You've got to redo the packing. A lot of times the washer on the bottom, if they haven't done it in multiple years, the washer on the bottom will rot out and rust and everything. So you just literally have to replace everything. A lot of times they'll bend the guide rods. The guide rods are always bent on the nuts at the top. They'll tweak out the guide rods so you can't bring the ladder back up. Right. But in, in bringing it back up on a properly functioning system, are you finding resistance? Because now it has to go through the same process of um, pushing There's the supposed oil to be back. resistance so it doesn't leak with the packing and everything, but not a great deal. Just enough to where you can still bring it up. Most of the time the guide rods will tell you just by the tension on the guide rods. If your guide rods start That's flexing, the bending. it's too tight. So you just loosen up your packing a little bit. Now, so, this so. is information for everybody here. So you know that on all these tubular uh, railing systems, uh, they basically, they have a cap on the bottom. Right. This is what they primarily made of, is it? It's just it's, galvanized. It's, it's just, just galvanized a galvanized pipe. But it's a yeah, standard uh, interior pipe, a plumbing pipe, right? right? So they have a cap on the bottom, yeah. and so if you were releasing the pressure to get the oil out, that's where you, you take the whole ladder down and do this, or you take it and do it in place? Oh, you have, no, you have to take it down. And you'd be a disaster to try and do that up in place. So take the whole ladder down. Take it down. So now you, uh, you have the, you take the, the cap off the bottom, that's going to let you drain. What fluid, uh, what fluid have you put back in there? Standard hydraulic oil. Standard hydraulic, hydraulic, hydraulic oil. oil. Then you're going to find this long 5 inch rod. Well, it's half inch diameter rod. Half inch or 5 inch from half inch. You have to replace them. Most of the time, you have to replace them. Standard, you get those, uh, any special requirement of those? Um, Are they standard cold steel? Cold steel. Cold roll steel, half so inch. Any uh, metal yeah. fabricating place. So now at the bottom, you have to thread it, right? Because right. you're going to, so you have to get a threader at the bottom of the rod. You're saying that now if you have a two inch pipe or well, inch and a half. Most of the time they're usually inch and a quarter in diameter. Okay, on the, the inside. Time. Yeah. So you got to get a washer now that's going to be one sixteenth less than that or one eighth. Right. Just 16. a little bit less. It's hard to tell as far as the actual diameter. So where are you going to find on. that special washer? Uh, usually at uh, tool supply places or hardware we'll stores. We'll have a very whichever. specific yeah, big washer. It's not the standard little, you know, it's not a flimsy little washer. It's a sixteenth of an inch thick. The, the washer? Correct. No, it's got to be... Works. Yeah, it's about 16 minutes. Okay. And then it's just barely, it barely gets onto the wall, and this is the only, there's no rubber in, in, inside no. them. That's just this no. flat, flat washer. And then as it pull, as it drops, it creates suction, right? The, and that's what lets well, it drop. It only allows X amount of oil to go by that washer as it's dropping through the Right. Tube. And then when you're cranking it back up, it's, it has to squeeze the same oil back, back through it. No. So what t at the top you have another cap that the the rod and that there's a bushing up there, no bushing. Well, normally what they'll use is they'll use uh, bushings that have been inverted with couplers, and then you usually have quarter inch packing, graphite packing. Most of the older ones and stuff have a rope type packing. It's almost like uh, you use around uh, old plumbing fixtures and stuff like that. So you don't have to go to a specialty a specialty uh, industrial supply house to get a lot of these things, right? Yeah. You're not going to find any of the stuff from the. Um, no. Uh, the washers you might find, you might and lucky. that would be about it, and maybe the half inch nut, but other than that, no, you're going to a metal fabricating place or someplace else. Perfect. So that's how, basically, we just got a lesson here today on 
on what you can tell the client needs to get done in case he has to fix the, the hydraulic. What's the second alternative when the hydraulic is just not able to be fixed? You can build a brand new ladder, right? That's your only other choice. Right? That brand new ladder, you're going to go to hydraulics? You're going to go to a cable and a pulley. So it's either two cables and, a, and two, two weight boxes on it. It's a balanced ladder now that drops. And I spoke with Daryl, he wants that to be about six inches per second, similar to a rolling door. So if it's going to come down, it's got to come down reasonable. Um, so that's turn, converting a, a hydraulic over to a to a, uh, a pulley a pulley weight box system. What's another way? I don't know if they'll do that in LA. In LA, do they allow that? As far as I know, it's apple for apple. If you've got a hydraulic ladder, you put another hydraulic ladder back in. Well, again, it's I think. What you're saying that it's up to building and safety, you know, as far as. But I think it's a, it's an interchange. Meaning, I don't think I've never had that come up as a question whether or not I have a hydraulic that converted over to a pulley, because you're basically it's a counterbalance system. That's a, the hydraulic is using the hydraulic. The counterbalance is basically if the ladder weighs 200 pounds, you got you got 195 pounds worth of, worth of weight, and single cable or double cable. What's the, the other thing you can also do? Is anybody familiar with a fold out? Say again. I think I see one or two where they're replaced. So what it basically looks like a drain pipe when it's closed, and when and the bars are in inside themselves, and then there's a pivot here and a pivot here, and as soon as you release the ladder, which goes all the way down to the ground, it makes an 18-inch ladder. It's called a fold out. The release is up at the top, so it's either a hand or a handle, and you just release it. So a lot of times you can take out a when it's possible, you can actually take out these hydraulics and fill in the hole cut a hole at the end of the, the railing system so that you're near the, near the building because these are usually mounted to the building all the way down to the ground and they look like a drain pipe. Nobody can climb up. They're very difficult to climb up but some people can. But uh, the intention is once you hit it, it opens up against the building or perpendicular to the building and then you climb down like a regular ladder. That's a fold out. Anybody ever seen one of those? I have it in LA. Yeah, they exist. And uh, you know who sells a lot of them is uh, very expensive. It's Jami. Anybody ever see Jami? Uh, aluminum, they make aluminum ladder that they sell to a lot of residentials where people get these fold-out ladders. But they, they normally range, uh, you know, five to eight grand for these or eight to twelve grand for these because it's an all aluminum product. Right? But you can find uh, most ma metal manufacturers uh, will be able to make it because it's two pieces of angle with a rod going across, pinned to the sandwich, and when you close it, it basically looks like a drain pipe. But when you release it, she opens up to 18 inches. So next time you go on yard, you just go online and just, you know, and I, I believe I might have some video here that shows a, one of those in operation. And uh, a lot of times they're they're very simple and they make it, uh, they're, uh, they're an anti-theft device for a lot of people. So did we uh, find some batteries? Yes, yes. Oh, perfect. Okay. Awesome. Um, so any other questions, then I'll start the, I'll start the class, but any other questions besides, so this was good. So now you just, one of the biggest problems you're gonna find with is the hydraulics. We'll talk about cantilevers today and stuff like that, but if you just got a lesson from him in regards to how the, how the hydraulics, because a lot of people just won't tinker with it. Because after you tinker with it, sometimes it's still flawed. And he's done that. Oh, yeah, all Expense all the all whole all hydraulic to a client only to put it up and it doesn't want to work. You know, the, the, it's coming out too fast. And again, six uh, inches per second. The national norm is that in conversation, which is written no way, is two to three feet per second. And that's too fast. So he wants it similar to a, to a door. And we discussed that. He goes, I didn't put it in, but he wants it similar to your fire doors, six inches per second. Yeah. Any other questions on ladders? What are the kind of ladders you got? Well, you got the accordion ladder. You guys got a few down here. The accordions are really heavy in San Francisco. And you know, the accordion ladders are now outlawed in San Francisco in that if you're building a new fire escape, you can't use the accordion ladder because they're nice scissors. You know, they'll cut pinkies and toes and things off if you use them incorrectly. But they're great. You ever see them? They just open up like an accordion. They're very rigid, but you see them heavily up in San Francisco area. A few have made their way down here. So that's the accordion ladder. You also have the slide ladders, the, you know, triple stack or quadruple stacked. Okay? So those are made just like, you know, you're going into an attic space. You know how you get an attic space and some of them are ladders that basically three slide into each other? It's the same ladder. Anybody else know of any other? They have ship style down here. 
what we call ship style. So you talk about the, the, the triangle one? I haven't seen many of those. The ones that have the triangles? Basically, it's the one that's underneath the fire escape, bottom fire escape, and you walk out on it. As you walk out on it, it has counterweights that counterweight the balance of the ladder, and it literally just drops on down. It just hinges on down. You walk down the ladder, and once you step off the ladder, the ladder will go back up. Yeah, but then that's going to be contrary to what it says. The ladder must come down, okay, and stay down. So let's talk about, and, uh, and again, I'll, start, I'll finish that conversation, then we'll start jumping on this. What that means is a, a fire escape must be single action requiring no special knowledge. Very common information. You're supposed to release the ladder, which is part of your testing, release it. It's supposed to go down, hit the ground, and stay in position until you do what to it? Crank it back up. Do you know that that applies to cantilevers also? And applies to these, it's not a ladder, it's not a cantilever, it's a counter ladder. <laughs> And basically what you're relying upon is people to step out onto it, use their weight to make it come down at what, six inches per second? Because you got a 100 pound person and a 200 pound person, what are they gonna do to that ladder? It's gonna come down, slam it. And, and so I'll give you a scenario. Let's not make it the ladder, but the ladder is a combination of the two, which really doesn't make any sense. But these, these ladders underneath should have been real, should have been counterbalanced stairs but for some reason they snuck in a counterbalanced ladder, which doesn't even make sense. It's not a norm for me to ever build. I've never built a counterbalanced ladder. I built counterbalanced stairs. Huh? Yeah, counterbalanced stairs. It's a full staircase that's gonna come down. It has the weight on the back or the weight on the nose. And you come down, it's a full set of stairs for anybody, children, old people, or, or firemen. Counterbalanced ladder is kind of weird because you sort of have to go backwards down it because as soon as you step on it, you got this little one little bar that you're standing on and you're kind of holding onto something flimsy and these things come down and slam. So a lot of them don't even have rails. It's really a wacky thing. So uh, again, that's a, a pre-existing non-conforming and you may want to share that information with your, the, on, on section five. Because it doesn't ask for that in, in findings on three. So again, some of these things are going to be uh, coming, but the, the way a counterbalance is supposed to work, if you notice, they come out of a platform, come down five steps to a pivot point to a counterbalance weight. As soon as you release, there's a release mechanism that's supposed to be up on top, and it shows you on the, on the book that I'm going to show you. Once you release that, the thing's already dropping by itself, hitting the ground. By the time you get to the pivot point, you're already stepping on it, continue, and you self-evacuate. Then, the firemen arrive, and what do you think they're going to use? The very staircase that's down, already in position. They don't have to go get ladders, they don't have to go get poles to bring it back down. Because if they have to use a pole to get it back down, what are they going to do? They're going to need one fireman to put his foot on it and stay there while everybody, everybody else uses it. So it, that's not what counterbalance stairs are supposed to be. You're supposed to release it, drop it, use it for both tenants and firemen. Okay? So let's, uh, let me get the... <coughs> keeps rocking and rolling. I apologize that my battery went dead. They're in that Also. No, it's triple A. He already got it. Sick on this break. Put it wrong. Yeah. Any other questions before I get started? Um, the tendency uh, nationwide is to replace the ladder systems because there's too many flaws, especially with hydraulics. Everything else you can repair, pretty much. Hydraulics are just, it's, it's, a, it's a old science and uh, we've had nothing but, uh, but issues with them. Um, first of all, let me, uh, let me grab one of the books. Everybody got a copy of the book? So I've been I've been in this business. Um, did somebody, uh, did they, can I just get one of the books? Sorry, one of the books. Yeah. So um, so I've been in this business since I got hijacked. In '54, my dad hijacked me when I was 12. So I've been in this since '71. So what I have is a master's degree in reverse stupidity. Right. It's not that I know what to do. It's that I've done everything wrong, every possible thing wrong I've already done. 
And the only thing left was the right things to do. So I collected a lot of data. And in this data, I started putting all this data together. I started putting this data in a common area, and that was basically my library. Then I said, you know what? A lot of people need this information. So if you go to the National Firescape Association.org, you're going to see all the classes that I've taught from Seattle to San Diego. You're going to see all the documentation that I created that didn't exist. All the confidence tests that I had to make nationwide, including some of the very questions that you guys have on your confidence tests, came out of my Seattle and Portland, Oregon confidence test that I built 10 years ago that I submitted to LA for consideration. So the, the, it's no longer your opinion they want is yes, no questions, pass, fail questions. So, so for example, this is what you have already in your book. This is what happens when nationwide when somebody says I have a fire escape violation, what do I do? A design professional is supposed to act this way. What do I do if I have to repair it? Well. A vendor needs to follow these rules under the guidance of this design profession. What's a painter do with all the CPA and lead law? Well, a painter is supposed to follow these rules because you can't weld on fire escapes. Is everybody clear on that? That if your fire escape is older than 1978, do you know that you can't weld on that fire escape because it's presumed to have lead? And if you want to weld on that fire escape, you better have a fire detail. You better have a professional licensed lead inspector from the state of California tell you that that fire escape has no lead or very low lead. Otherwise, the fine by the EPA, should you be caught welding on a fire escape as a means of repair, which is not recommended, and I'll tell you why in a second, it's 37500 bucks per violation. So no more welding on fire escapes. Aside from not having a fire permit or a burning permit, that's the, that's the issue you're going to have. So be very careful on that. We're going to talk to you about lead safe, so that's what the EPA. So a lot of times your vendors are supposed to have an, gone to an EPA renovators class. It's an eight hour class. They pay 250 bucks. And that basically, they're going to be told what to do when you're getting, on, getting onto any building that has lead. What is the procedure inside wearing the white suit, the little mask, the little gloves, right? The, the negative room, the plastic, the slit, and the plastic, and then you got to wipe the walls down. Oh my God. But outside, oh, see, she's put a piece of plastic outside. You still wear the little white suits, but nowhere near as crazy as inside. So thank God they don't put fire escapes on the inside. They put them outside because they'll, it's a little bit more relaxed, but it's still the same rule, and you gotta go through an eight-hour course. OSHA, does anybody, you, you know, there's a, there's a law in OSHA that not many people know about. Do you know that if I'm touching a building, OSHA 1910.37 states that during alterations, renovations, or repair of any existing building, you must maintain two means of egress at all times, otherwise they shut the building down. So, you look at some of these buildings downtown that are being gutted, you got electricians and plumbers and fire protection people inside, what's the only two means of egress? There's main stair, stairs. right? The main stair. And what's the second means of egress? Fire escape. So, what's supposed to be certified prior to any activity? The fire escape is supposed to be certified and in working order. If not, you're in violation of the OSHA code. Now, what can you do in case the fire escape is a real train wreck and you know they're not ready to fix it? Well, it says right there in the OSHA code that um, unless you provide alternate, alternate, alternative means acceptable to the authority having jurisdiction. So what is that? Scaffolding. With stairs inside, do you now need to fix the fire escape? No, but at the end you do but not in the beginning anymore. Yeah, but most buildings, I mean, the majority of buildings have at least two staircases. Correct, but now you're talking about uh, some of your buildings, you're gonna find some of these older buildings. Yeah, the they have the central stair, and they have a fire escape. So now, and, and here's, the, here's the good question. Let's, let's be clear on who can build fire escapes, what can, when can you use fire escapes? The law is very clear. No new fire escapes. That's a building code. And that gets abused all the time. Because if you continue reading, this is what it says. No new fire escapes on new construction. But any existing building, barn, institution, hotel, church, you know, tree house, guess what you can build all day long to meet the second means of egress requirement? A fire escape. So 
Every now and then they latch onto that statement, no new fire escapes from the building department. The fire department sometimes hears that and says to the guy who's renovating some building, some mansion, says, oh, you can't do fire escapes, can't do fire, you gotta put a staircase inside. And they're wrong. The code says, any new construction, you can't build new fire escapes. So you'll never see a new building going up with a brand new fire escape. They have the two means of egress inside. That happened in the 40s, 30s and 40s, that's when they made the change. Because nobody was taking care of these things anyway. But if you have a pre-existing building and it has a fire escape, so a lot of these lots, guess what they're going to use as a means of egress? The fire escape. Anybody familiar with the, the corner of uh, Gr uh, Grand and uh, 7th? Louis, uh, the Louis uh, restaurant on the bottom floor? We did that fire escape. That's, that, that's all high-end condos. And guess what their second means of egress is? Fire escape. How many stairs do they have? They have only... They have a main stair and a secondary stair on the back corner that doesn't meet the means of egress for all the, all the, all the, because we did the interior stair also, but it's in the back corner out of the way. So when they recut the place, they had to make it so that the fire escape was at the end of a tunnel and the fire escape fed all the condos. So be aware that any, any existing building, you can put a fire escape on to meet the means of egress, even if the building inspector said, no, he is half right because he's quoting you no new fire escapes from new construction but you can build fire escapes till the as long as that building the existing building is not torn down you can put fire escapes on the end of that so you're all right at renovations every renovation you ever have now and there's another another cut line if you're doing more than 75 percent gut on the inside of a building a lot of times you will be talked into two stairs inside and remove the fire escape outside but as soon as you start playing a, a, a different game a lot of times what they do is prior to doing a full gut or they do phases, they fix the, the stair, main stair going in the building, they fix the fire escape on the back, then they start the process of conversion. So that in their plan submittal, they're already submitting a, an approved means of, of egress. Or sometimes an upgraded means of egress to not let them force them into real estate on the inside and putting this major stair in an awkward place because it changes the whole dynamics. I think it's the 75 foot rule. When you get out, you gotta go this way to a fire escape, or I mean, I mean this way to an egress, or that way to an egress. Whether it's internal or external. You can't go to the same location and cross your first means of egress to get to your second. They won't allow it. Okay? All right. So guys, very quickly, what the book will show you today, this is a confidence test. This is something I designed 10 years ago in the city of Seattle. So if you go to seattle.gov and you go to fire prevention, you'll see this confidence test. Some of these questions are on the test that you guys have now uh, for Red Form. Got it? But this is more in depth. This is for a structural engineer or others acceptable to the building official. Got it? This right here is a confidence. This is, a, this is an, an evaluation. This is not a Red Four. This is an evaluation stating that the fire escape has certain deficiencies. Well, they are photographed and highlighted. So this is usually what they want when you look at when they do an evaluation in, in Seattle or Portland. Not only do they want you to fill out one of these documents, they want you to submit photographs with it, okay, which is not required on the REC form. Make sure that that showed up as that was. Okay. Um, again, this is all for you guys to read a little bit more. How to repair. Here's some. Here's some uh, examples of how to properly repair a rail, a tread, or a ladder. So repair criteria is also here for you. Here's another document. This is also another certification, okay? Some states, all they want is an opinion affidavit. This is, even though they call it a certification, you read right here in the, in the body of this, it says, to the best of my information, knowledge, and belief. What is that? Is that fact or an opinion? Is this an opinion? Got it? So this is the escape clause that's on the bottom of a lot of your engineer reports that you may have to get for that building. Now you get it. The owner has to order that, okay? And they'll have opinion disclaimers. This right here is how all fire escapes are built. If anybody got a copy of September's um, NFPA, they celebrated 100 years of fire escapes. And they actually did an article with, uh, on 100 years of fire escapes and they mentioned the National Fire Escape Association as doing classes like this nationwide, okay? If you guys look at it also, on here is the cantilever, and you see the arm on the cantilever? You see the release arm? 
that release arm on the cantilever is basically a, a um, it's a locking mechanism. So you know what people complain that they're breaking into my building, pulling down the cantilever? This locking mechanism doesn't let you break, doesn't let you pull down the cantilever. It basically blocks your way up here on the platform so that when you release it, again, no single action requiring no special knowledge, it basically releases the cantilever and starts dropping. But if anybody down below wants to throw a rope up and pull it down, they can't. So it's an anti-theft device. It's called, a, it's called a release arm. We're also going to talk about how fire escapes must be continuous and down to a public way. So every now and then you have a fire escape system that's incomplete and it lands on a roof and that's it. 